Well, no sooner than I had um, renewed the uh, master cylinder in this Mercedes, uh, 1991 Mercedes 420 SEL, I went and drove the car for the uh, very first time after the uh, master cylinder rebuild. And uh, the car actually broke down on me for the very first time. It was a rather hot day around maybe 91, 92 degrees. And um, took it to work, ran fine, and then uh, after work, uh, got up on the interstate, drove it on the interstate, ran beautifully. And uh, went to uh, a nearby shopping center about halfway home, stopped and had dinner, and went to um, start it back up, and it wouldn't start. All it would do was just crank and crank and crank. And I eventually, um, I opened the hood and looked around. I checked for the, any blown fuses, uh, wiggled some of the, like the fuel pump relay there to make sure that it was uh, still seated, hadn't worked its way loose or anything, make sure I was getting fuel. Um, you know, made sure all my spark plug wires were still firmly attached and haven't come loose, especially the one on the um, ignition coil, which you can't see under the, the cover there. Um, you know, did basically what I could do with having no tools, no diagnostic aids whatsoever, and just determined that it's just better to uh, go ahead and have the car towed, because even if I was able to figure out exactly um, why this thing broke down, I pretty much wouldn't be able to fix it. I don't have a, you know, a big trailer full of uh, Mercedes parts behind me all the time, and, you know, can't always repair everything on the side of the road. So rather than having it um, towed to a dealer or a shop to have, um, you know, diagnostics run on it, which you can do with this plug here, I decided to go ahead and have it towed home, and that way I can um, get it back here where I can look at it and also get a, uh, a free ride from the tow truck. And um, later on that night... Um, you know, I kind of had a feeling that uh, the way this thing was acting, uh, when it first broke down, that it might be ignition. Uh, you know, basically, I might have a bad ignition coil, but I wasn't sure, but I was strongly suspecting it because the car was just running beautifully up until that time. And all I did was I just shut it off. Went and had dinner. After dinner, I came back and tried to start it, and it wouldn't start. So kind of tells me, or at least at the time I was thinking it might have been more of an electrical problem, which is why I was focusing my attention more on the, the fuse boxes and the relays, OVP relay there, um, things of that nature. So I was kind of joking with the tow truck driver, because the tow truck driver is like, why are you having it towed back home? Why don't you just go have it towed to the Mercedes dealership? And I said, um, you know, I think I might know what's wrong with it, and I bet you anything, once we get the thing home, it'll just start right up like nothing ever happened. And sure enough, it did. We got the thing off of the uh, flatbed tow, tr tow truck and uh, cranked it up that later on that night. And I wasted no time driving it back over to its uh, normal parking spot until I can have time to dig in a little bit deeper to work on it. And um, at the time that I did that, once I had the engine running that same night, uh, I, went, <coughs> I went ahead and uh, took the opportunity to see uh, they're trying to reproduce the, the problem because um, the fact that it started uh, after it came off the tow truck was telling me that this is not only uh, potentially an electrical problem but also a heat related electrical problem because essentially what ended up happening is, is that uh, when I shut the thing down to have dinner that basically was uh, what we call a heat soak where the engine is uh, shut down water pump is no longer turning, there's no longer any air going through the radiator the hood shut, there's no air going through the engine compartment to keep the engine cool, so temporarily the engine will actually increase in temperature and then fall back down to uh, ambient conditions after uh, several hours. So I reproduced the, uh, actually I was successful uh, when I had the car there, um, had the engine running, and uh, I uh, basically was of a mind to just let the engine just keep running and idle and not drive it and see if the same problem would occur again. And uh, sure enough, after uh, it reached normal operating temperature, which I guess is a little over, for this car, a little over 80, this car tends to run uh, pretty cool, which is good. I uh, 
shut the engine off and then immediately try to restart it and I couldn't start it. So at that point I was actually very happy that it broke down again right there in the parking spot because now at that point in time I had the conditions under which this thing broke down and I can dig in a little bit deeper with all my tools and uh, start troubleshooting again and within about 30 minutes I figured out what the problem actually was and uh, it actually turned out not to be the ignition coil. Um, so this video um, is going to be a combination of going over the processes I used to diagnose um, the no start condition on this car and it's also going to be uh, uh, documenting um, the replacement procedure for the uh, parts that actually I've determined that have failed. So before we get started, uh, and this is going to be key to the diagnosis, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, pull this connection off of the ignition module here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and measure the continuity or the resistance between these two terminals. This is just a coaxial cable, just like on a, your home cable television setup. I'm going to measure the resistance between those two. The engine is nice and cold. And um, let's see what that resistance is. That resistance um, is supposed to be anywhere between, I think, around 680 ohms to... 1200 ohms and we'll go ahead and see what it is now under a cold temperature conditions and that's good that's uh, absolutely within range of the factory specifications 881 ohms And now, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and connect this back up to the ignition module. And what I want to do, uh, for the benefit of um, being able to show you guys exactly what happened in the entire diagnostic process, I'm going to go ahead and uh, clear my tools out of here, shut the hood, I'm going to start this engine cold and I'm going to let it reach normal operating temperature and hopefully you don't normally hear me say this but hopefully the engine is going to break down again and uh, will then be under the conditions with which it's broken down and be able to um, begin the troubleshooting process. So we'll go ahead and fire this thing up. Hopefully the battery is not too weak. I did a lot of cranking a couple weeks ago with it. As you can see, this engine starts right on up, got good oil pressure. The engine's ice cold. I'm going to go ahead and let it warm up now. Other than having that annoying high idle, which I still want to try to diagnose and fix, the engine is running very well, nice and smooth. The car has 180,000 miles on it and it runs, still runs smooth. So I'm going to let this thing run for about maybe a half hour, 45 minutes with the, uh, the hood shut. Let everything get nice and toasty under here and uh, we'll see if it'll break down on us. Okay, it's been about uh, a half an hour now, and this engine's getting nice and toasty. You can hear the clutch fan is engaged to uh, full speed. So this engine's doing the best it can to uh, cool itself off. Blowing out about 120 degree air. So let's see if this thing's going to break down on me in my driveway. I'm not sure what the critical temperature is that this condition occurs in, so it may start back up, it may not. It just depends on 
how hot the entire engine is, including the transmission all together as an assembly versus just the... Oops. Well, my car just broke down. Same thing it did. This is really, really good. It's exactly what I wanted to have happen. Excellent. Just shut right on off. Dash is lit up like a Christmas tree. Engine is hot, but it's clearly within normal temperature range as well within normal range. Let's see what's going to happen. I have to cycle all the way off and back on again. It's just not going to start for me at all. Excellent. We've reproduced the problem. That's exactly what I wanted to have happen. So, now this Mercedes is officially broken down. We're going to go ahead and pop this hood and uh, see what's going on with it. See why it broke on me. What I'm going to do is make that same measurement that I made before I started the engine up cold. infinite resistance now. So before, on this particular component, we had around 800 ohms, well within specification between the 680 and 1200 ohms, and now we have 23.24 and climbing mega ohms. Basically, this component is uh, rapidly approaching open circuit. Interesting to see that. When I made the same measurement the night that it uh, broke down, um, it was actually at the point where it was infinite ohms. So, right around when this component reached around 23 mega ohms, the engine died. Definitely a temperature related ignition failure. Just what I wanted. Now what we're going to do is we're going to put this back on. And we're going to I'm going to show you or walk you through the uh troubleshooting process that I uh went through both when it broke down and also when I got it here. The first thing I did I didn't have the benefit of this at the time that you guys did when you heard the engine just die. But uh, usually when something like that happens, it's generally electrical versus mechanical. So the first thing I did is I went ahead and just put the key to the full on position. And I listened for the, for the uh, fuel pump to uh, come on for a couple of seconds and stop. And you may or may not be able to hear that. I put my seatbelt on to stop that annoying buzzer. I don't know if you can hear it. Let me put the camera back here. That's one cycle. Hopefully you, you guys heard that. Anyway, the point being that I know I've got fuel going to the engine. I know that the um, brushes inside the fuel pump in this 186,000 mile car are still in good shape and that I don't have an intermittent fuel pump problem. I know that my over voltage protection relay is good. I know that my fuel pump relay is good. 
Next thing I'm going to do um, is verify I've actually got fuel going to the engine itself. Um, maybe I've got a fuel injection problem. Maybe I've got a clogged fuel filter. Maybe I've got a bad fuel pressure regulator. Myriad things could be wrong when you're talking about this uh, Bosch fuel injection system. They're very, uh, they can be very mysterious things to troubleshoot. So we want to make sure that no matter what engine you have, whether it's a brand new, you know, Bugatti Veyron or an old piece of junk in the junkyard, you got to have spark, air, and fuel to make these engines run. So the next thing I want to do, I know it's not going to start, but I want to roll the engine over anyway. And while I still have time, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to smell the tailpipe for raw fuel. And I definitely smell a raw gasoline coming out of there. So, I know that I'm getting fuel to the cylinders because it's coming all the way through the cylinders and back out the exhaust system. I know I'm getting air into the engine. There's nothing blocking the uh, air intake snorkel. The car's just been sitting here and it shut off on me. I know the air filter is good. That points me to the ignition system. She's not getting spark for some reason. Now the problem is, is it not getting spark because I have a bad coil wire? Do I have a bad rotor? Do I have a nasty distributor cap that's all corroded up inside? Do I have one or more bad spark plug wires that are not allowing spark to come through? This coil is also pretty close to the exhaust manifold. It does have a heat shield. Maybe the coil temperature got too hot. Hundred and twenty three degrees. Maybe that's too hot for that coil being uh, close to twenty three years old. Manifold is two hundred and seventy two degrees. Maybe I've got uh, a bad uh, ignition module. How hot is that getting? 116 degrees. So now we've got this problem reduced down to uh, most likely 99% sure it's ignition. And what we want to do is see why we're not getting any spark. Do I have a bad coil? Do I have a bad control module? Blown fuse? What's going on with this thing? So the first thing we're going to do Let's check to see if we have spark, and uh, let me get this protective cap pulled off of here, and we'll check for that next. Okay, protective tap or cap is off. I've pulled the coil wire from the distributor housing, and I ran a uh, standard alligator clip lead to it, and I've got the lead just sitting on top of the uh, metal air cleaner housing, making myself a, a spark gap. And this housing is usually grounded, but to make sure the housing has a good ground, I went ahead and ran another alligator clip lead to a good solid engine ground on this lifting uh, bracket right here. So what we're going to do now is uh, try to verify we have no ignition, verify that that's what the problem is, so we can uh, troubleshoot further, step by step. I'm going to zoom in as much as I can, because seeing sparks in broad daylight's not really the easiest thing to demonstrate. That should be close enough. Okay, hopefully you guys were able to see that. We have no spark. We verified that this is an ignition problem, a uh, specifically a temperature-related ignition problem brought on by the uh, heat soak that we just did earlier. Now, the problem is, why don't I have ignition? I know that uh, everything here 
to the engine is probably okay, rotor, cap, and plug wires, and all that kind of stuff, because I don't have any spark coming out of the coil. So now what I need to do is, is figure out why that is. It's looking more and more like I might have a bad ignition coil, which is not an uncommon failure in an old car, because the windings in there expand and contract, expand and contract, and you're dealing with a lot of voltage, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25,000 volts. When you have insulation breakdown like that, it forms an internal short, and it grounds out, and you have no spark. So what I want to do is uh, rule out maybe a bad cable and start looking at this coil. Let me pull this cap off of here and we'll dig deeper and deeper into this mysterious issue here. Okay, put this back together, methodically working our way back. I want to rule out a faulty ignition wire. I've got my uh, good old alligator lead plugged uh, directly into the coil tower. I want to see if that uh, secondary of the coil is putting out any voltage whatsoever. Got a pretty good feeling it's not, but the whole point of troubleshooting is to eliminate variables one at a time very methodically. I'll go ahead and try to crank it and see what happens. Just like I suspected, didn't get any spark. So now, it's looking more and more like a bad coil. So what I want to do now is, is to not shotgun it and just start replacing one part after another, because these parts on this particular car cost a lot of money. This module right here alone is over $900. There's a possibility that this coil might actually be good and nothing is telling it to fire a spark. The primary side might not get any, be getting any feed. So let's get our uh, trusty volt ohm meter over here. We'll go across these terminals and we'll crank the engine and see if this coil is uh, getting any power to it at all. Okay, now I got the volt meter set to the uh, DC voltage range. And we have our two alligator clips hooked directly to the primary uh, windings of the coil. And um, what we're going to do is look for a change of state on the voltage. This is going to be not an AC voltage, but a DC voltage. And it doesn't really matter what the voltage is. It depends on the make and model of the car. Some cars have 5 volts. Some cars have even less than that. Because you have to remember the primary winding on the coil has an extremely low resistance. If you shoot 12 volts across that, you'll fry the coil. So we're going to go ahead and crank this thing again and see if we have any kind of change and state on that voltmeter, plus or minus voltage of any kind whatsoever. So a little bit right there when I uh, energize the ignition system. Nothing. No change of state on the primary side of that coil. So, at this point, I cannot condemn that coil. That coil is uh, more than likely going to be okay. For some reason, this coil is not being told to fire. There's one other thing I can look at, working my way back to the rest of the system, and it might be this awesome $900 ignition module, or EC EZL module. Fortunately, um, I do have a spare one of these, so let me go ahead and try to hook that spare in here and see what happens. Alright, got my spare EZL module somewhat installed, at least electrically. Got all the uh, connections hooked up to it, and very importantly, uh, since I don't really want to install this yet, I don't, I don't know if my original EZL has failed, I have a ground wire going to the uh, same place on the engine lifting bracket there. So, let's see if the reason why the coil is not getting any power is due to a failed EZL or uh, ignition module. We got the coil tower, or the uh, 
main wire pulled off here, and same as before, we're looking for a spark to jump that little gap against the air cleaner. got nothing, which uh, is actually somewhat good news because these modules here are incredibly expensive. So we'll go ahead and take that out. This is going to take two hands. I'll get this module out of here and um, we'll actually know what the problem is in just a few minutes. Okay, everything is uh, somewhat put back together, at least together enough for the engine to uh, run eventually, hopefully. And um, I want to reveal the problem to you guys now. And um, if you guys are familiar with Mercedes, uh, you would be familiar, you'd be very familiar with the uh, measurement I was taking on this particular connection right here and why I was taking it before and after. Uh, for those of you that don't know, this connection here is the crankshaft position sensor connector. And this is actually uh, what I pull off of the EZL, just like I do here, in those situations where I want to crank the engine to um, diagnose other issues. Maybe test the starting performance of the, um, the battery to see how the battery is holding up, see if I can predict if the battery is beginning to fail, how much power it has. Um, I might want to do that to uh, pre-lube the engine and build oil pressure if the engine's been sitting <coughs> around uh, unused for several months. But um, without any uh, signal coming out of this, there's absolutely no way that ignition system is going to fire. And that's why I wanted to measure this uh, before the video, because I had already figured out that this, would, this is what the issue is. But I wanted to kind of uh, walk you guys viewing this video through the process of how to determine and zoom in on specifically, uh, to zoom in on, on the specific component that was causing all the trouble on a uh, fairly expensive, complex, modern car like this um, in order for you to avoid... Um, spending lots of money uh, replacing parts unnecessarily and um, don't be mistaken if you take it to a dealer especially with a car uh, this old um, the dealer in a lot of cases would very likely do the same thing and charge you all that extra money um, intermittent problems such as this specific uh, especially electrical problems like this can oftentimes be very difficult to isolate and even if you did manage to get the engine running um, without knowing the specific root cause you wouldn't really have that level of confidence that you used to have anymore if you wanted to take this thing on a long trip so it looks like what's in store for me now is to go ahead and replace this uh, crankshaft position sensor and uh, see if I can get that uh, engine running again. I'm going to go ahead, since the engine's been sitting for a while, it's still fairly hot. I'm going to measure the resistance of that thing one more time just to see what's going on here. See if it's changed at all. It's all over the place, really. Um, there might be some capacitance in there too. If you get an ohmmeter across a capacitor, it'll tend to do that because ohmmeters actually shoot a small voltage through the circuit. But 35 mega ohms is basically open circuit to that ignition module. It's just not going to see any kind of signal. So now what we'll do is uh, come look at the uh, new part. This is the crankshaft position sensor on this car. That's what it looks like. And here is where I was measuring. This position sensor, or CPS I should say, was made by Wells. I tried to order the uh, Bosch unit, but um, they said it wasn't available and took it out of my cart. 
but indeed this does look to be a genuine Bosch unit uh, made by Wells. It even has the original Mercedes logo on there, which is going to be in keeping with my overall philosophy of uh, fixing something to the point where you never know I was actually in here, like that master cylinder still has the original factory marks on it. The crankshaft position sensor, um, we can look on this Ford engine over here, this Ford 4.6 V8 from a Crown Victoria. On this particular engine, it's mounted right here. And what it is, I've got a brand new one right here. All this is really, in a lot of cases, and it's true on this Mercedes, is a uh, magnetic core with a bunch of wire wrapped around it. It's just a magnet. And what happens is, is there's slots on a wheel inside the timing chain cover uh, attached to the crankshaft, usually about eight slots, and as those slots pass this magnet, the magnet is very, very close to the, uh, the slots, it generates a voltage from these two terminals here. So this setup here is basically a signal generator. And when it generates that voltage, it um, basically is telling the computer or ignition module about crankshaft rotation, how fast the crankshaft is rotating, and in some cases, what cylinder is uh, coming up for fire next. Um, that was a Ford component. Um, the Mercedes component is very much the same way. It's just a magnet with a bunch of wire wrapped around it inside here. And you've got a coaxial cable with two connections here, a ground and a positive, and you're going to see a most likely a, a pulse train of some kind um, coming out of here that varies with engine speed to um, feed into this ignition module along with vacuum and fire the plugs, fire the coil. So what's going on apparently is the just like the ignition coil, the wiring in here. Some of these may have electronics built into them on the on the much newer cars. I think they do. They might have an analog to digital converter built into these things. I'm pretty sure on this particular car, being 91, it's really going to be like the uh, Ford and just have a coil of wire in here um, generating some sort of voltage to send to the ignition module. And what's going on, this is on, on the Mercedes, um, it's actually mounted all the way back against the, the flywheel back here somewhere. On the Mercedes you've got a, uh, you can't see, but you've got a cylinder identification sensor. On the crankshaft damper, I think that notch right there is actually one of the notches for it. And uh, its output can be taken right here. But you've also got the crankshaft position sensor on the other end, on the flywheel, with the same idea, you've got notches built into it, and each time a notch goes by, it triggers a pulse to be read by the ignition module. So I'm going to have to wait for the engine to cool down and, and go ahead and replace that, but that's why this thing is um, so long. And being against the, being mounted where it is, um, way back in there against the firewall and everything, I'm sure that this sensor is getting plenty hot. This is not a very scientific way to tell, but it's pretty toasty down in there, 120 degrees. I can only imagine how hot it is attached to the engine, 130 there. So just like with ignition coils, um, because they're constructed in very much the same manner, we've got insulated, very fine insulated wire in here wrapped tightly around a a fair right core. Um, over time, the expansion and contraction um, along with the heat has probably degraded the insulation in here. And there's probably a certain point along this coil where you've got two pieces of wire that are separating like that. And as the uh, temperature gets hotter, it expands and those wires pull apart and you get that high resistance. So without taking the thing apart, which is not really serviceable, that's going to be my uh, going theory there. 
So I know what I need to do. I know at least, at a bare minimum, that the uh, CPS is bad on this thing. It's the original CPS, 23 year old car, 180,000 miles. You really can't complain. Um, while I have to do all that, um, I'm going to go ahead and take the opportunity to check the uh, rest of the ignition system components and um, see what's going on with them. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is, is that you can see uh, from the factory, and I noticed this when I did the master cylinder a couple of weeks ago, everything's got this uh, protective film on here. It's like a clear coat almost. You can see some of the clear coat flaking off on this ABS uh, slash ASR unit here, which is also very expensive. You've still got, you've got some on this uh, power steering pressure hose as well. And you've also got some on these ignition wires. And the reason I bring that up is because that tells me that these ignition wires are more than likely the original ignition wires on this car. And um, that's good engineering if you can get 23 years out of these parts, but I think what I want to do is go ahead and replace the ignition wires as long as I'm going to be doing uh, ignition system work and just make sure that the entire system is uh, um, up to specifications and um, running good. It looks like somebody replaced the coil wire. This is not the original coil wire. This looks like uh, aftermarket. Nothing wrong with it. It's just uh, something to observe. And uh, let me get a screwdriver and pop off the uh, cap here and see what's going on inside here. Okay, got the uh, cap and rotor pulled out along with this uh, protective plate. And the situation is not looking very good. Rotor button's worn pretty well, and we have pretty significant buildup of. Uh, carbon deposits, metal transfer, those kinds of things on these electrodes. It's a good quality distributor cap. Looks like it has brass terminals. But definitely pretty old and um, really should be replaced. I was going to say cheap insurance. It's not really all that cheap. These are expensive caps. I think they're like $50 or more, but definitely uh, well worth it to avoid a breakdown situation. And here's the rotor. Pretty beefy component here. Look it out here in the sunlight. That is pretty eaten up. It's actually in pretty bad shape. A lot of arcing going on in there, a lot of build up. Definitely worth replacing that. And looking at the date code, 1990, and a 91 Mercedes, along with evidence of the same factory coating on the ignition wires, I'm really suspecting that uh, this cap and rotor are the original cap 23 year old 180,000 mile cap rotor on this car which is just astonishing that the engine was even running. Good quality components but definitely nothing lasts forever. It's definitely time to replace these things. Let's look down deeper into the uh, distributor housing and see what's going on in there. To my surprise, we have what looks to be, a, uh, at first glance, a uh, centrifugal advance mechanism. It's going to take two hands and the engine's hot. But what ends up happening is, is as this thing spins around, these weights fly out against the spring tension here, and it advances your timing. And what I said is actually uh, true and not true on this car. Uh, that's exactly how this 1972 Lincoln advances its timing. It's got a points and condenser, condenser ignition system. But um, on this car, it's not, that situation is not the same. And it's, I thought at first that I finally found the answer to my high idle problem because if you notice, 
there is one counterweight spring. It looks like the other spring is popped off. However, that spring is nowhere to be found inside there. And uh, looking at some, a lot of the manuals and service information, some of these cars had two springs, some had one. And the other thing is, is the way this car is designed, there's no way to advance the timing just with this mechanism here. You, you cannot set the timing on this car by turning the distributor like you can on the um, 72 Lincoln, which just has a vacuum advance and centrifugal advance. The timing on this car is controlled completely with the uh, EZL module uh, with various inputs for coolant temperature sensor and throttle position as well as engine vacuum. Um, all this does basically is sets the basic timing and everything and then the uh, ignition module takes over from there. So um, that's not going to be the source of my high idle problem unfortunately. Maybe replacing the CPS will do will uh, help with that, but certainly this seems to be okay here like it is. Um, another similarity between this and the Lincoln, however, is uh, if you notice there's a wick right here and it's bone dry. And what needs to happen is uh, some lightweight oil needs to be put down in here to make it go all the way down that shaft so that this shaft gets lubricated. Uh, there's no oil pressure from the engine making it up this far. So we want to make sure this is uh, lubricated because just like the ignition module, these distributors are expensive. They're around $500. So you want to make sure that you don't have a lot of axial play here. You've got a little bit, which is actually amazing with this amount of miles on here and no lubrication, as well as up and down. That's still within, that still feels pretty good, so I want to make sure that uh, I uh, remember to uh, lubricate that as uh, when I go in with all the new parts. So, to do this job, I'm going to go in with all new ignition cables. I've chosen the uh, 7mm NGK um, ignition wire set. They had, it has the original boots, and it has a really good design in the wiring where it has a random pattern as to how the wire is wound to reduce uh, RFI interference. And these are the only ignition wires I was able to source that had these nice um, tubes around here, around these uh, wires. Just like the original Mercedes wires has to uh, keep your cables routed nicely. They're the only wires I was able to find um, that were like that, so that's a nice touch. And then of course I'm going to go in with a genuine Bosch uh, distributor cap as well as the uh, a brand new rotor so spark plugs on this thing I could change those and, and I probably will but I just don't have any on hand right now they have about maybe 20,000 miles on them so uh, they're not uh, that's the least of my worries at this point but uh, and I really do wish I could get a new o-ring for this thing it's uh, hard as a brick but uh, one thing at a time. I'm going to go ahead and let this engine cool down to where I can work on it. Um, we'll jack the thing up in the air and we'll get that uh, CPS replaced and uh, take it from there. Okay, now that we have just the uh, left side of the car up in the air on a jack stand, um, first thing to do to get that CPS out of there is Make sure you can get the uh, two bolts loosened up that hold the uh, cable guide in. And to do that, you're going to need a uh, six millimeter Allen socket. And one of these bolts is an intake manifold bolt. Apparently, they both are. You can see the uh, carbon build up on there. So they're going to be a little bit tight, a little bit hard to to get off. So just take your time and make sure you don't uh, strip the. Uh, the fasteners. So I just got these sitting here ready to come out. And then I want to um, make sure that I have all the uh, routing correct with this cable and to the extent possible I want to use these original um, fasteners for the cable as well too. So let me go ahead and uh, begin um, pulling some of this back just by moving that and lifting up these wires carefully. And we'll uh, get the uh, main coax cable 
out of the way and we'll be able to get under the car and uh, actually take the sensor out. Okay, now that we're largely done top side, I got the uh, coax cable all ready to uh, come out. And I've got uh, both bolts loosened up on the, uh, the bracket here. It's time to go uh, under the car and see what's going on. You'll have a uh, cover on the top of the bow housing you'll have to take off. A little plastic protective cover that just has these clips on here that you can just sort of uh, squeeze together and lift up. The car is so old it just basically came right off. And let's see, right up top there that I'm shining light on is the uh, CPS, the crankshaft position sensor. You can see the Allen head bolt I've loosened up already. That's a five millimeter Allen. So we'll take that out and then the uh, sensor just basically pulls straight on out. Um, you've got a lot of uh, or actually not a lot of clearance between that and the uh, exhaust crossover pipe so you'll have to use um, what amounts to basically a standard allen wrench and uh, hopefully that's not going to be too tight for you in my case it wasn't so we'll go ahead and loosen that up there's the fastener and see if I can get this thing out of here while I'm still filming. You just basically want to twist it and pull it up. Clearance is very tight. Kind of got it in a good position to come out there. You can kind of see that uh, working its way out. I'm going to go ahead and continue to pull that out and uh, get out of the bell housing and um, we'll go from there. It's basically fairly straightforward, you just don't have a lot of clearance. In fact, it's already touching the crossover pipe. Hopefully I won't have to remove that crossover pipe. That would make this job a lot more difficult. And here's the uh, old sensor finally out of there. It just basically comes out very easily. You just base you use a twisting motion and pull it on out and just be sure to uh, clear the uh, exhaust crossover pipe. And you can see that it had a pretty hard life. I got my uh, ohm meter hooked up to it, that's what's making the noise. And I'm once again measuring the uh, continuity between the two output terminals now that the sensor is uh, back to ambient temperature. And we're back down to the original value that it was when I started the video, around 800-900 ohms. And uh, as the engine warmed up, it shot up to uh, in the 25 mega ohm range. So this is definitely the culprit of all the problems. Now it's just going to be a matter of uh, sticking this new sensor in, which uh, just goes in the exact same way. And uh, let me get that started and we'll be right back. Okay, the uh, new crankshaft resistance sensor is in. I wish I could have filmed it, but there's just no way to hold a camera and uh, get that thing in there at the same time, especially with the limited space that's available. You can see what kind of a hard life this thing lives right near a hot exhaust crossover pipe. Probably not the best place to put it, but it did last 23 years, so that's kind of hard to argue with. And you basically just want to go in with a twisting motion and work it on down into the uh, the bore. And there's a cylindrical bore that's in the uh, bell housing right there that's pretty tight tolerances, so you'll know when you, uh, when you have it aligned properly and can go on down with it. So, there's one... Uh, then you can just go ahead and use your... Uh, Allen wrench right there to tighten the bolt and you just want to go snug with, with it. It's just going into an aluminum bow housing. There's no point in uh, zonking down on it real tight. Uh, the new part, uh, as, long, as well as this old part, has this shield around the cable. You can see that the uh, old part, um, you want to make sure that you match up the new part with the old part as far as the distance between the shield and the metal bracket as well as how much cable is coming out of the shield. This is actually a protective shield for the cable both against abrasion and to reduce heat. So once you get this thing installed you kind of want to hold the shield with one hand and pull the cable through with the other and make sure that you take up all the slack and that this shield 
um, is as close to the uh, actual sensor as possible to protect it from heat damage. And uh, that way it'll be just like the original. I've already uh, routed the cables, put some anti-seize on the uh, end tank bolts and uh, just torqued them down good and snug and made sure that everything is routed as it, um, as it was before. I took some uh, Q-tips and um, cleaned the bottom of these clips here so that there's no abrasion from uh, uh, sand and dirt and everything like that getting in here. So I got the cable routed just like it was before. Going out to the EZL, I'm going to go ahead and uh, tape this thing off and measure the, the continuity. See what kind of continuity we get. And um, we'll see if we can get this thing fired up. i got to get under here one more time and uh, put that uh, protective shield back on the bell housing. And we'll be ready to uh, test this ignition system. Okay, just for completeness, now that i got the new sensor installed, I'm going to go ahead and measure the resistance of the new part. And I got about uh, 900 ohms. And that's to be expected. So now, we'll go ahead and uh, connect up the CPS. And we'll see if this engine's gonna fire. Definitely uh, fix the root of the problem. The engine's running pretty good. Still have that high idle though. Next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and replace the ignition wires and cap and rotor. And then we'll call this job complete. Okay, carrying on with this job to complete the ignition system maintenance on this thing now that the initial problem has been repaired. Um, it looks like it's going to be fairly straightforward. The OEM wires, and we know they're OEM because they have this original coating on here, just like on everything else. These wires are labeled 5, 6, 7, 8, and then 1, 2, 3, 4 on the other side. So it's just going to be a simple matter of um, making sure we get them in the right order on these um, fasteners here. And the uh, new wire set that I have, I don't know if I've mentioned it previously, it's a NGK wire set. They've also taken the trouble to um, label all the wires. So it's just going to be a matter of um, taking everything off which is fairly straightforward these boots just pull right on out it looks like I'll have to uh, loosen up this uh, fuel supply line bracket lift it up a little bit but the whole thing basically just comes out as a harness and uh, goes right on to the distributor cap and then looks like it's the same kind of deal on this side looks like we got a I may have to uh, loosen the idle air control valve, move it up out of the way, loosen that bracket, and see if I can uh, either loosen this or reuse this same nylon fastener here. And then there's your labels, one, two, three, and four. One of them fell off. So this looks to be a fairly straightforward job. I'm going to go ahead and start with the uh, distributor cap and uh, go from there. Okay, I got all the wires removed from the uh, distributor cap. The uh, distributor cap is also labeled with your cylinder identification. And this comes off with uh, these three screws that you loosen up. And you just go ahead and pull it straight off. Set that aside somewhere. Rotor is the same way. Now the, go ahead and just pull that directly off. 
And then we'll want to remove this. We can go ahead and inspect down inside the distributor and also gain more access to apply some uh, lubricant and some oil down in there and get that wick nice and wet because I don't think that's ever been done. And talking about these springs like I was talking about earlier, put the rotor back on here, it's not actually to advance your timing, it's, it's actually to move the rotor in a different position to maintain the distance between the uh, electrodes here as the engine turns faster and faster. That way you don't get uh, misfiring or uh, crossfire. It's not to adjust your timing. So unfortunately my high idle problem is not related to the uh, counterweights in here. Anyway, let me get some, some oil on that. Put this back on and uh, putting the rotor back on is just simply a matter of pressing it on and the uh, cap just uh, will sit down just like that. Okay, got the uh, distributor wick all nice and uh, saturated with oil just from a regular oil can there. And you don't want to add too much because I mean, when the engine runs it might fling it all around here and uh, contaminate the uh, electrodes. That's one of the reasons why they have this cap here. So we'll just go ahead and replace the cap. Make sure that's all centered up. We'll take our new rotor. Note the uh, key in there and the keyway there to get it close to the right position. This slips right on like that. And now what we want to do is make sure we put the cap on right. You've got uh, three different positions that you can clock it in. And what you want to do is make sure that basically it's, you know, the text is uh, facing right side up. So it just goes on like this. Make sure it's nice and secure. And then we'll take our screwdriver and run these screws down. And then we'll go ahead and uh, change out the ignition wires. So if you're ever confused, you want to make sure that basically the number three cylinder is pointing toward the, uh, the fan, pointing right toward the front, if you get this thing clocked in the wrong position. And I'm about out of tape, so I'm going to go ahead and change tapes and uh, tighten all this down and start hitting these wires. Okay, the uh, spark plug wires are all installed. I got everything routed properly and was able to use all of the original tie downs and everything. It took a little bit of time to uh, get these things undone, but a lot of times you can get these undone with a small screwdriver and be able to retain the original fasteners and the original cable routing. And same thing on this side. Be able to use this original tie down as well as this uh, original clamp. However, the rubber here is getting really, really hard. And that brings up a good point. Um, a lot of the wiring and plugs and things under this car are uh, very hard right now. You've got uh, a clip here that broke off. And a lot of the wiring is just kind of brittle, so you want to be careful when you pull these connections off and move them out of the way not to get too much of an angle on them when you try to route these wires. So everything's routed as the uh, as it was in the original form and some of these wires have a little bit extra length to them and I just basically turn the uh, connector the other way around just to relieve some of the, the slack in the cable. So um, got the new cap and the rotor and all the wires in. It's ready to start up. And another tip is you want to use the uh, dielectric tune-up grease, the uh, silicone grease, on the uh, ends of the boot for the spark plugs and also the uh, distributor cap and everything. So now with our new wires, new cap, and new rotor, and new crankshaft position sensor, let's see if this engine is going to start up and keep running.
Well, it looks like I got the firing order right, which is actually uh, pretty easy on this car. Everything is sequential. Five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four. And all the wires are labeled. As well as the distributor cap. So pretty much the only thing you can get wrong is clocking that cap in the wrong position. You got three chances to get it right. Sounds like it's running a lot better. All that needs to, all that remains to be done now, is to uh, put this protective cap back on the uh, distributor, as well as uh, install the air cleaner. After I get done inspecting some of the other things under here before I'm done. And uh, this car will be ready to uh, take on another thousand mile journey if need be. So this uh, was probably one of my longest videos I've ever done, but um, we actually accomplished a lot with this car today. Um, I tried to uh, show you guys how to diagnose a uh, no start condition or engine failure or breakdown condition, kind of the old fashioned way. Um, these cars are so old now that a lot of the shops and a lot of the dealers may not even have the uh, computerized diagnostic equipment made for this car anymore. On this car, it's a proprietary setup. It's not OBD1 or OBD2 or OBD anything. Um, if this issue were to happen back in the mid-90s or something, the shop could just plug their diagnostic in there and look at the... Uh, crankshaft position sensor profile as well as the ignition pulses and pretty much figure out almost immediately what the issue was. But uh, I don't have any of that equipment and uh, a lot of the shops actually don't anymore these days. They can't keep every single part for every single car for every single year. They've got to make room for the new stuff, the new Mercedes, which are a lot more advanced. So um, this was kind of an exercise in old school troubleshooting. Uh, regular standard petrol engine you have to have air, fuel, and spark. So without one or more of those things, you're going to, or actually without all of those things, the engine's not going to run. So we kind of uh, methodically went through and uh, made sure we had fuel, and made sure we had air, and then made sure we had spark, and spark ended up being where the problem was. And then it was just a, a matter of um, starting toward the front and working our way back through this, the entire system to um, try to find out what the root cause was and uh, that ended up being a failed crankshaft position sensor which I never really have seen before. They're, they're pretty simple devices. I've never had one fail but due to the uh, age of the car and the mileage on the car as well as the peculiar design where the exhaust crossover is actually higher up right behind the engine versus under the car um, that sensor has a pretty hard life as far as uh, thermal cycling as well as sustaining high temperatures. So I hope this will this video will um, help you guys uh, diagnose your your car uh, kind of the old-fashioned way uh, without using a lot of expensive diagnostic equipment. Um, all I really had to do was utilize a, a standard uh, volt ohm meter and just um, methodically troubleshoot until I found um, the root cause. Um, electrical issues, or actually a vehicle electrical systems, believe it or not, are my specialty. You know, a lot of my videos are mechanically related because most of the time if something's wrong with a car, it is mechanical. This is actually the first electrical failure I've had on this car. So it was kind of interesting to uh, go through the entire troubleshooting process. A lot of shops, uh, they'll spend a lot of time trying to diagnose um, electrical issues that cause a uh, no-star condition. So um, one of the benefits of being able to do that and get to the actual root cause is the fact that the problem is actually known versus just replacing parts until the problem is fixed and never really knowing exactly what happened. So this gives me confidence now that uh, the problem actually is fixed and that the uh, I can take the car on a um, long trip if need be and have pretty good confidence that uh, 
this thing is going to be reliable for me for hopefully another 23 years.